This is CBC Here and Now. When the resolution comes down and the verdict is given, it's going to have a direct impact on so many more children than just Carter. Talks break off over a human rights complaint against the Eastern School District over help for a deaf child. Now this family wants a formal hearing. All sizes of figures with squid lines and jiggers are in Holyrood where the squid are rolling in. It's a rare sight these days, but for people here, a welcome and delicious one. The story coming up. And it's busy at Lions Park in St. John's as the province hosts the Canadian Fast Pitch Championships for the first time in nearly 30 years. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now, I'm Carolyn Stokes. We begin tonight in Portugal Cove, St. Phillips, where the mother of a deaf boy says the school board is failing him and violating his rights. Now she's bringing her complaints to a hearing at the Human Rights Commission. Here and Now's Meg Roberts has been looking into the story and joins us now live. So Meg, why is this mother taking legal action? Well, imagine sitting in a classroom trying to learn, except you can't hear the teacher well and they speak a different language than you. Kimberly Churchill says that's what it's like for deaf students going to school in this province. Her son Carter starts grade three in September and she sa says she still doesn't know if he has an ASL teacher to further his language skills. Now two years ago she filed a human rights complaint against the school board and the Department of Education and Early Childhood Development but she says it was a waste of time after four failed attempts at a mediated settlement. She says her son is running out of time to learn both ASL and English in a formal human rights hearing is their last option. What do you want to come out of that hearing? We want to have um, full acknowledgement and acceptance that there has been discrimination that's happened with deaf children, in particular our child um, Carter. Um, we want to be able to, of course, have him uh, have access to a full-time teacher who is um, proficient with American Sign Language. And we want the assurance to know that we've got that teacher every single year until he finishes school, just like every other hearing child. Carter, unlike all hearing children, we don't have that guarantee. We don't have the luxury of knowing that Carter's gonna have a teacher. And I don't know how many hearing parents out there uh, are worrying about whether their child is gonna have a teacher in the fall. I know that my husband and I have spent many countless nights um, not sleeping and um, talking about this and worrying about this. Explain to me what it would be like for Carter at school without a teacher. He is completely isolated and left in a world all to his own with no one to talk to. He communicates so well and so effectively. Unfortunately, there's barriers that now exist because of the School for Deaf closing and our government not putting the supports in place to help children like Carter. Um, and they need to take a responsibility and accept that uh, they should be doing something for my child. As hard as, is it, as it is right now to go through this process, we know that when the resolution comes down and the decision is made and the verdict is given, it's going to have a direct impact on so many more children than just Carter. And that gives us a lot of fuel to keep fighting as well. And we don't want our son to ever look back and ask us why we didn't fight for him or why we didn't try harder. We always wanna make sure that we can tell him we did everything. Churchill says the hearing could cost upward of $50,000, but she says her son's education is worth it. Now, the English school district wouldn't comment on the complaint. It said in a statement that the type of resources provided to deaf students varies because every student is assessed differently. The Department of Education and Early Childhood Development says a review is underway to determine how services can be better delivered. It said one of the first steps taken as part of that review is the creation of a new position at the English School Board. The position will work directly with deaf and hard of hearing students. Thank you so much, Meg. That's here and now's Meg Roberts reporting. Well, a man whose alleged actions grounded an American Airlines jet in Happy Valley Goose Bay appeared before a provincial court judge today. 31-year-old Edward Myhill from London had an apparent wound to his left eye as he entered the provincial courthouse. The plane was on its way to Chicago from Heathrow when the crew made the decision to land early yesterday afternoon. The airline describes his actions as disruptive and the pilot told air traffic control that he had to be restrained. My 
Cahill now faces three charges under the criminal code, which include assaulting and threatening a flight attendant, as well as mischief, and he faces two counts under the Aeronautics Act. Myhill was not released from custody and will be back for a bail hearing on Monday. Time now to bring in uh, meteorologist Ashley Rawweiler, who decided to go where all the action is tonight out in Dildo. <laughs> so Ashley, how are things going out there? It looks beautiful. It is absolutely gorgeous out here. You couldn't ask for a better day. It's warm, it's sunny, there's a little bit of a breeze keeping you uh, a little bit cool, but uh, yeah, absolutely gorgeous day. It's so lovely to see all the hustle and bustle that's happening uh, out here in Dildo, but uh, as far as that weather goes across the province, it's not only nice here, it's nice pretty much everywhere. We are starting to see some cloud cover roll in uh, as we head through the night tonight that the evening looks absolutely gorgeous across the province. And as we head through the day tomorrow, a little bit more unsettled, there is a slight chance we could see some showers pop up. I'll have all those details and your forecast as we head and get closer and closer towards the weekend when I come back. Oh, I guess I'm throwing. <laughs> okay, so I'm not the only one out in uh, out and about today. Jeremy, I hear you're out somewhere. Where are you? Yeah, Ashley, I'm uh, at Lions Park here in St. John's, standing on the softball field. It's the 2019 Women's Fast Pitch Canadian National Championships. And the opening ceremonies are just about to get underway, but they've been playing softball all day here, and they will be for the next couple of days on multiple fields throughout the city. But earlier today, I had the opportunity to meet a very special team from Newfoundland and Labrador, and it's the first time ever that a team from the western portion of the island has been represented at this national event. Oh, well, it's a big deal, of course. Obviously, playing all those years, and we've played in provincial uh, tournaments, but we've never, ever played at this level. So, uh, you know, when we uh, knew that the Nationals were here in St. John's, we decided that if we were able to put in a team, we would. So we started to get together, and, and here it is now. Our team is the West Coast Wildcats. Uh, we're from the western side of Newfoundland in the Quarterbrook area. We have players that are range from St. Anthony to uh, the North Shore to Quarterbrook area to Deer Lake. We all come together for a game of ball and having a good time at it. This player we have is 15. The oldest player we have is um, 50 something. <laughs> Well, we don't have the optimal weather that most teams have here where they can start in April out on the fields kind of thing. We started in a gym in January, but we couldn't really hit the field until June. But, uh, you know, we've come a long way. Most of us only met yesterday. <laughs> so, uh, but, uh, you know, the core group has been playing together for about, we started in about January. So we've been uh, trying to kind of mold this team. We practiced together yesterday and uh, try to get a feel for everybody and get uh, to know people. Last night we got together and tried to gel a bit and kind of, you know, talk and laugh and have that kind of team, I guess, dynamic, get together and say, you know, we're, this is what we do, this, and so people get to know each other, they feel more comfortable. Everybody's so pumped. We can't believe that we have this opportunity. Uh, they say it's the first time in 50 years, um, so it's well before my time. Um, and even though we come here to compete, we also come here to watch and see what amazing athletes that our uh, country has. First batter was pretty nervous, I would say, and a few of us too that have never played. Other people here have played in you know, competitions before, but uh, people from Western Newfoundland, uh, most of them have not played. So it, it was a bit nerve wracking at the beginning, but uh, the jitters are out. The first game is over and uh, we're ready to move on. So as you can see now, the, uh, the players from uh, various parts of the country are coming out on the field as part of the opening ceremonies. Now as for the West Coast Wildcats, they played two games today. Now they came up a little short, but I just spoke to a number of members of that team and they are still all smiles. And some of the players that we spoke to earlier today say that they hope that this event and their appearance at these games will help grow women's fast pitch softball on the western part of the province and in the northern peninsula as well. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Jeremy Eaton in St. John's. We're live now to one of the most popular spots in town, the Dildo Boathouse Inn, where Guillermo has gathered many of my...
That's Jimmy Kimmel Live last night with another segment from Dildo. Kimmel's mayoral campaign gag continues to build steam on the ground and on his show. Here's a look at last night's segment, which includes a campaign advertisement. Guillermo, how you doing? How's everything? Everything is great, Jimmy. Great. I guess the most important question is, have you found any weed yet? <laughs> I'll take that as a yes, all right. <laughs> okay, and let's get a closer look at Captain Dildo because I think that this is something kids are really gonna love. <laughs> Dildo is all yours, Jimmy. Oh, oh you think so? Is the, yes, has the 100%. The reaction been positive? Yes, of course. Oh, well, that's great news. I'm, and I'm excited to announce I'm ready to unveil my first campaign ad. Are you guys ready to see it? Can you see me there, Dildo? Okay, very good. All right, let's roll it. Here we go. Way up in Newfoundland, which turns out is in Canada, there's a special place, a little gem of a city that needs a leader. That place is Dildo, and that leader is me. My history with Dildo goes back weeks. I didn't know, like, who was like Jimmy Kimmel, and I had to go on Google and make some search because I don't watch TV. Even though we haven't met, I know Dildo people. Like the city you love, I am flexible but firm. And as mayor, I will fight for you, not with you. I will bring back Dildo Pride, and I'll protect your scenic shores with a sweeping new environmental plan. Dildo needs a captain. I would love to steer this ship. Jimmy Kimmel, mayor of Dildo. And here now is Mark Quinn is in Dildo tonight. And yeah, so we've got Mark, some breaking uh, news here tonight, of course. Uh, they're actually, we're finding out there is some competition for the mayor. There's actually someone else in the running now, and it's no less than his arch enemy, Matt Damon. So people are saying, you know, we heard Jimmy saying there that he's flexible and firm. People are saying now he's facing some firm competition and uh, some stiff competition even. And people here are coming from as far away as Texas and people from BC and people from Ontario and even people from Florida. And they're all saying that they think that Jimmy would make a good candidate. But now other people are starting to wonder, could there be another person in the running? I spoke with some people today and here's what they said. Come on, Jimmy, my love, you got to come here. You'd love this place. Do you think Jimmy Kimmel should be the mayor of Dildo? I don't know. It depends if you do a good job or not. <laughs> so what does he have to do to do a good job? Um, he definitely needs to be screeched in first so he can be an actual Newfoundlander and then we'll see about how he does. He made a good point about the American president the other day, so I think that <laughs> stands for itself. <laughs> if a dildo can run America, then an American will be able to run dildo, so <laughs> I, I agree with that. <laughs> I think that his intent is, is what we should go by. If he's willing to invest in this community and do good things, I'm all for that. I'm hoping he'll fix the cell service. I think that would ha that would be a must. His sidekick seemed to be unhappy with that. <laughs> he needs to be able to reach his family. Yeah, I agree. What issues do you think he should tackle as the mayor of uh, Dildo? Oh, heavens. That's a hard one for me. Be the roads. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people here are wondering if Jimmy's going to come. Do you think he's going to make an appearance here in, in Dildo? No way. He's got Guillermo to do his dirty work. I know that Premier Ball has been asking him to come a lot. Um, I think it would be absolutely great for him to come. Um, I think he's a little bit nervous about coming because I don't know if he realizes what he's going to get when he comes here and how much fun he's going to have and how much he's going to enjoy it here. So I think that he really needs to bite the bullet and come on in, Jimmy, and have a good time. Okay, so sorry about that. The cell service is a bit weak here, so we're not quite hearing each other. But, uh, you know, the question now is, will Jimmy come here? And, of course, we don't know yet. Uh, we're hearing rumors that he's coming. We're hearing rumors that he's here. We're hearing rumors that he's going to have his vacation here. But it's all just rumors now, and we're all waiting to see what happens. Uh, but now that we have another person in the running, another candidate in this race, some of the issues are emerging. And as you heard, people said they're hoping for improved roads. And if you're listening, Jimmy, improved roads and improved cell service. So live in Dildo, I'm Mark Quinn for Here and Now. Well, it's a milestone for a downtown St. John's community center that helps vulnerable people. The gathering place marked an anniversary today at its annual garden party, celebrating its 25th year in operation. But as Here and Now sees hair reports, festivities brought about mixed emotions. It's a celebration, well, a celebration of sorts, because organizers say the growing need for the services they provide is nothing to party about. 
The annual garden party at the gathering place marked 25 years of providing the basics, necessities like food, clothing, housing. Some people in the neighborhood have been coming for years. I've been here for I don't know how long. First day we're over there. And uh, what goes through your mind when you think about how long they've been providing these services? They do a great job, especially Sister Dorothy. I was here when they had it, when, they, when it was open, when they opened, when they had the kitchen, the small kitchen first, and then after that, now it's, the, now it's more bigger, now more place you can sit down and eat. It all started 25 years ago when Sisters of Mercy and Presentation Sisters wanted to do more than just hand out food at the door. They wanted to give people a place to go, to gather. Today there's three meals daily, a doctor, nurses, social workers, free haircuts, manicures, a washer and dryer, and most days, bingo. It's a job to keep up with the demand. By September, we will be over 2,000 in, in individuals, individual names, people who in the past year have come through the doors and continue to come on a daily basis. Um, that's a staggering number, so we have to talk about this. The Gathering Place has now launched an awareness campaign focusing on this growing need, calling for a community response. Numbers show that 97% of the clients who come here are from this province, but the numbers don't tell the story, and the common theme in their story is that there's never one single event that brings them to these doorsteps. Cease here, CBC News, St. John's. We are live in Dildo tonight. Coming up, Ashley Brawweiler will be back with the detailed weather forecast. As you can see, it is just a gorgeous evening out there. Lots of excitement building, lots of questions being asked about what's going to happen next.
time now to check in again with Ashley. And Ashley, it uh, looks like the spotlight and the sun are shining on the people of Dildo this evening. <laughs> Absolutely are uh, a gorgeous evening right here as the sun uh, is just still pretty warm actually but uh, all eyes are on the town of Dildo and whether Jimmy Kimmel is going to show up or not so I decided to do a little bit of a Jimmy Kimmel watch forecast. Let's take a look at that. Uh, let's see uh, what we're thinking. So there's the town of Dildo there. Uh, temperature wise tomorrow 22 degrees. I have a 20 to 70 percent chance that uh, Kimmel will show up and then a, a slight chance of showers in there as well. For Friday we're looking at sunshine and 22 degrees. A little bit less of a chance and then into Saturday it looks like uh, some showers and uh, a scattered chance that uh, Kimmel will show up uh, in town at some point but uh, really all jokes aside it does look like an absolutely gorgeous evening temperatures today reached a high near 22 degrees 17 through Bonavista and then uh, for most of the island sitting around seasonal for this time of year should be sitting around 20 22 degrees and then for uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay, 20 degrees, 17 for Lab City. And finally seeing those double digits in Nain at 13 degrees. Currently uh, dropped a little bit, 10 degrees for Nain and then 19 for Happy Valley Goose Bay. And here in St. John or in St. John's rather sitting at 22 degrees. Now, uh, as far as weather goes today, just saw a little bit of cloud cover. Avalon State absolutely gorgeous today and up through Labrador saw some cloud cover move through as well. And then uh, through the night tonight, things should clear out. Looking at a, a beautiful evening, slight chance of some showers moving through Lab West, heading towards Lab Central as we head towards the early morning hours. But overall, 13 degrees for St. John's. Those winds variable 10 to 15 kilometers per hour. Grand Falls winds are sitting at 8 degrees. So we're going down to those single digits. Corner Brook, 9 degrees. Those winds generally light. And then for St. Anthony, 9 degrees overnight tonight. Now, coastal areas of Labrador, 8 degrees for Cartwright. Slight chance you can see some showers there as well, up through Nain, 7, and then Lab City as well, as I mentioned, that slight chance of some showers. Now, looking through to tomorrow, a mix of sun and cloud for the most part, but we could see some showers develop in the afternoon, mainly for central, southern Avalon, and then for the northern peninsula as well. We could hear a few rumbles of thunder with this. Same for Happy Valley Goose Bay and then heading towards southeastern Labrador as you head through the overnight though things look like they'll clear out so temperatures pretty similar to what uh, we're seeing today a couple degrees cooler for some areas St. John's should reach a high near 18 degrees we can thank those easterlies for that 20 to 30 kilometers per hour Bonavista 17 Clarenville again have that slight chance of showers in there they will be pop-up showers if anything does develop Gander 22, Harbor Breton 20 degrees. And as we head towards the West Coast, temperatures in the low to mid 20s, 23 for Gross Moore. And again, have that chance of showers pretty much uh, all along the northern peninsula. And again, that slight risk of some thunderstorm activity are possible. 20 degrees for St. Anthony. Those winds will be variable, generally light 10 to 20 kilometer per hour winds. Uh, 16 degrees in sunshine for Mary's Harbor, but then I have that chance of showers in for Cartwright heading towards Happy Valley Goose Bay. Lab City looks beautiful. With with 17 degrees and those winds out of the west with 15 to 20 kilometers per hour. So that's a look at your forecast for tomorrow. We're going to look ahead when we come back because we're getting closer and closer to the weekend. Thanks so much, Ashley. <laughs> Well, it's uh, not just Dildo that has all the action today. All hands are excited in Holyrood, where the squid are rolling in. It's an extremely rare sight these days, though it was once a staple of rural life. But most people aren't asking questions. They're just catching the squid as fast as they can. Here now, Zach Gowdy caught a few himself. Oh, yeah. How's this for grabbing dinner? In Holyrood, people from all over are racing to the beach where thousands of squid are waiting. Well, the squid's rolling in. We can have to get a bucket full to eat. Lots of them there. First time squid have been in there now in about 30 years, I suppose. They started rolling about a week ago, and I found out about this morning, so we just came up now and got a, got a bucket full. <laughs> right, is this dinner we're looking at here? Dinner, breakfast, dinner, and supper. <laughs> Squid rolling in and the frenzy to catch them was once so common that it inspired one of the province's best-known songs, Art Scammell's The Squid Jiggin' Ground. But in Conception Bay, the squid vanished long ago. Have you ever seen anything like this before? No, no, really, not in my lifetime. It must really have people talking around here. It looks like the word is out. Yeah, it is, yeah. They're coming in from everywhere now. They like the squid. <laughs> <laughs> the squid roll best at high tide in the morning and in the evening. But even at midday, there are so many squid, you can reach in and catch them with your bare hands. 
Just watch out for the squirt. Is it ink or, we, or just water? <laughs> Do you really want to know? Yeah. <laughs> We came down to buy some. We thought we were going to go over to the wharf and buy some, 25 pounds or so, and then we saw them out down here. We thought, well, free is better. <laughs> and I More grew fun. up not far from here in Harbour, Maine, so I used to see this regularly in the 1970s. This is a, it used to be a routine, and now it's a phenomenon. While people fill their buckets, fishermen are filling their boats as fast as they can. But even the pros have no explanation for why the squid are suddenly rolling again. I do not know. I don't know anybody know. I don't know anybody know where they go when they leave. There were lots of squid in our bay years ago when he, everybody knew the squid went away, and now they're on the way back. Now we're going to go home now, hope to jig them over in our bay. If you come out to catch a few, be careful of the squid's beak. The big ones especially can give you a nasty bite. <laughs> Ow! <laughs> I'm going to eat you just for that. Ow, he did bite me too. <laughs> he may be small, but he bit me. I'm going to bite you back. <laughs> like the song says, if you get cranky without your silk hanky, you'd better steer clear of the squid jigging ground. Zach Gowdy, CBC News, Holyrood. So you can see the teams lined up on the field as part of the opening ceremonies here at Lions Park in St. John's. A game is about to get underway, and we're going to learn a lot more about this event coming up after the break.
Welcome back to Here and Now. A scathing new report says Prime Minister Justin Trudeau broke the rules. Canada's Ethics Commissioner says Trudeau improperly pressured the Attorney General in the SNC-Lavalin affair. I take full responsibility. The buck stops with the Prime Minister, uh, and I assume responsibility for uh, everything that happened in my office. Uh, this is important. Uh, because I truly feel that uh, what happened over the past year uh, shouldn't have happened. Trudeau has long insisted he had the economic interests of the country at heart and says he can't apologize for standing up for Canadian jobs. SNC-Lavalin is facing criminal corruption charges, but the Prime Minister and others want to proceed with a non-prosecution agreement that will keep the firm out of court. If convicted, SNC could be barred from bidding on government work for 10 years. The Montreal-based company has 9,000 workers in Canada and 50,000 worldwide wide. And the leaders of the opposition parties have been quick and scathing in their responses to the ethics report. And what we have now is a clear picture of who Justin Trudeau truly is, and it's not who he promised he would be. He promised he would be accountable and ethical. Instead, time and time again, he has used the power of his office to enrich himself, reward his friends, and punish his critics. It's unprecedented that the Ethics Commissioner now has found two contraventions of the Conflict of Interest Act, two contraventions. And this one specifically, the deep concern is that Mr. Trudeau, the Prime Minister, was working to benefit the interest of a multi-millionaire corporation and was working to benefit his own self-interest to get re-elected. Singh went on to say that Trudeau is not fit to be the Prime Minister of Canada. Scheer says he believes there is enough evidence to support a further investigation by the RCMP. Switching gears now, let's check in with here now's Jeremy Eaton, who is at the Women's Canadian Fast Pitch <laughs> Championships. So, uh, Jeremy, just how fast are these pitches? Well, uh, we were watching a couple of uh, players from Saskatchewan 1 because there's two teams from the province of Saskatchewan here throwing a few beat pitches and they are throwing heat. They're throwing awfully fast. But now they're a little bit delayed getting the opening ceremonies started. So we were supposed to have a, a guest here to tell us a little bit about it. So we're still going to try to track him down. But while we're waiting, you can watch some of the players uh, leave the field. But this is the first time in nearly 30 years that uh, Newfoundland and Labrador has hosted this event. The last time was back in the year 1988. And then that's when Jackie Atkinson and Debbie Power were a couple of star players for the home team. Now here's a look at that coverage voiced over by a guy you may remember named Jonathan Crow. There's a good crowd on hand at Lions Park and they see Newfoundland starter Jackie Atkinson get into a little trouble in the first inning. 4-2 is the final as the last Saskatchewan batter flies out. Newfoundland wins their second in a row. Their record is now 2-0. and yeah, it was a big win against Saskatchewan. And I think it was a surprise to them. It was definitely a surprise to us. It's the first time we've ever beaten them in national play, so it's a really big up for our team right now. Yeah, I was really nervous. This, this is the first time I ever played in, in the hometown in such a big tournament. And uh, But after the first inning was over, we were okay. We calmed down quite a bit. You're 2-0 and now. Um, I guess anything's possible from here on. Oh, yeah. Uh, once we got our first game over with, we thought, well, we had a chance at it. Now this game, the Saskatchewan, a really good team, and now that we beat them, we're quite happy with that as well. There's a big crowd on hand to cheer on Newfoundland as they face their biggest challenge so far. Jackie Atkinson is the Newfoundland pitcher, and she holds the strong BC squad to just one run through the first three innings. The crowd gets behind Newfoundland after that, but this is as close as they come to scoring. Sherry Morrissey is on third with two out in the sixth, but the rally stalls as Becky Pendergast is put out to end the inning. That's basically it for Newfoundland as they get good pitching, but no offense en route to a 3-0 loss. You really have to work the ball around on them. You can't let up for them for a minute. I think that's probably what happened. A few pitches I probably let off and they got good hits off them. Um, they're, they're really quick. They were expecting to blow us out tonight, but we gave them a good run for their money at that. So you can see this is little Nora here, a uh, softball player in training. And uh, the reason she's here is because her dad here. And this is Patty. Patty, thanks for taking the time. I know the ceremony's just ended, but thanks for joining yeah, us. Thank you very much for the opportunity.
great opening ceremonies. So what's happening here today? Uh, we've got the start of the biggest championship for women, fast pitch in Canada. Uh, we've got nine teams across the country, two from Newfoundland. So uh, we started off early this morning and we're uh, on to a big game with our host Galway team. What sort of caliber, what level of player are these uh, players at there, Patty? Well, so they'd be the top female uh, fast pitch players in the country. Uh, a lot of uh, players from the other teams would be playing college ball in the U.S. So big opportunities for U.S. college sponsorships and uh, for the Olympics as well. Women's fast pitch is a Olympic sport in 2020 in Tokyo. And how excited is the softball community here in Newfoundland and Labrador to be hosting this event uh, for the first time since 1988? Yeah, so we're always excited. We've hosted a number of national and international events on the fast pitch side over the years. Uh, however, the first time we've had women's nationals here since 1988 is very special. So we're getting a different crop of fans out this week, and we hope it continues. So, so as you can see, uh, Gary's, Gary Locke, our camera guy, is uh, showing that's the team uh, representing the home province from Galway, but there's also another team from the west coast of the province. How excited are you to have two teams from Newfoundland and Labrador in this year's tournament? Oh, there's nothing better. We love to having the uh, teams from the east coast and the west coast, and it's always special playing in front of your home crowd at a national event. Uh, so there's nothing better. I know some of the teams have had some nerves, which is uh, fully expected, but we're looking for great results. Uh, but most important, we're looking for great performance from those teams in front of our home crowd. So the event kicked off at 9.30 this morning. Uh, how many games will be played between now and when does it wrap up? Uh, we're 40 or 50 games uh, for the remainder of the week. We've got a full slate of games at Lions Park, uh, three games daily, Wednesday through Friday at Victoria Park. Playoffs start Saturday and the championship game on Sunday. So uh, the weather looks like it could be nice, so you want people to come down and check this out? Yes, I think Ryan Snodden probably uh, <laughs> sending some... Uh, sending some good vibes back to Newfoundland, which is nice. So we always look for, uh, for great weather for an event like this, and I think we're going to get it. All right, man, I appreciate your time. Hey, Nora, do you want to say back to you, Carolyn? Mm -hmm. Look at the camera. Ready? <laughs> back to you, Carolyn. Say, Ready? Say back to you, Carolyn. Back, back to you, Carolyn. There you go. Someone's Thanks, after your Nora. job, Carolyn Stokes, and it ain't me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jeremy. That's great. Wow, 40 or 50 games. That's a lot of softball this week for sure. It's, it certainly is, and it looks like they're all going to have a lot of fun. <laughs> Thanks. I said, you come to Dillo for the name, but after you get to Dillo, you'll find out how well steep we are uh, in heritage and culture, and then you'll forget about me. They call him Captain Dildo. He's a local historian who knows there's more to this town than a catchy name. We'll hear about the history of Dildo coming up.
Yeah, that's Guillermo Rodriguez, Jimmy Kimmel's sidekick on his late night talk show at the Boathouse Inn in Dildo last night, learning some traditional Newfoundland music. This was posted to Facebook by the band Bacalou. No official word yet on whether he got screeched in, so we may have to watch Kimmel's show tonight to find out. And we're learning that Kimmel's mayoral campaign may have some competition. We're going to bring back uh, Mark Quinn right now, who's live in Dildo. So, Mark, tell us more about Kimmel's potential opponent. That's right. We're hearing it's his arch enemy, Matt Damon. And many people will know they have a long time feud that's been going on for a long time. And for people who don't remember that, we've got a bit of tape to show them more. So, look at this. Apologies to Matt Damon, ran out of time. I apologize to Matt Damon, ran out of time. I want to apologize. Come out, Damon. We ran out of time. We will reschedule him. Unfortunately, we are totally out of time. Um, a long time, and they're always running out of time. But Matt Damon wants to put an end to this, and uh, we're hearing he's coming here. And we've spoken, perhaps coming here. There's a lot of rumors. We'll see. But we hear he may come here, and we've spoken with his managers here in Dildo, who are already on the ground. And here's what they had to say. So I thought Matt might decide that, you know what, I'm not going to let Kimmel become mayor of Dildo. I'm going to become mayor of Dildo. So hopefully not only will Jimmy Kimmel come to Dildo, but we can get Matt Damon here as well. Okay. But then we'd have two Americans. Wouldn't you like to see a Newfoundlander in the running? Uh, yeah, sure, man. As many people as possible. But at the end of the day, you know, what I like about a democracy is we're allowed to vote for who we want to vote for. And if we decide we want to vote for a Newfoundlander, great, or Matt Kimmel, or uh, sorry, Matt Damon, or Jim Kimmel, fantastic as well. But right. you know the other thing is, who would you rather have protecting Dillo? Jimmy Kimmel or Jason Bourne? <laughs> Good point. Um, have you heard from Matt Damon? Is he interested? We prefer to keep that to ourselves. That's going to have to play out on its own. Okay. But Matt, if you're watching, which of course I know you are, because what else would you be doing but watching CBC in Newfoundland, Canada? Come on down, Matt. We'd love to see you, brother. We'd okay. love to see you in Dillo celebrating with Dildonians. You, it's a new mirror. So there you have it, uh, Matt Damon's people are here, and uh, it's not clear if he's coming. Uh, we asked, and they were kind of uh, a bit coy on that. They said they can't say, and there have been a lot of secrets here, a lot of rumors of what's going on. And of course, you can understand that because there are TV productions involved, some people are trying to reveal things later, and they don't want us to reveal things before they do and ruin their jokes and ruin their shows. So there are a lot of secrets flying around, and there's more to come. We hear there's some more events coming tomorrow, perhaps. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, live in Dildo, I'm Mark Quinn for Here and Now. Well, as the spotlight continues to shine on Dildo, Dildonians are quick to remind folks that there's more to the town than just a name. Gerald Smith is something of a local historian. Radio Canada's Marie Isabel Rochon asked him what he thinks of all of the attention Dildo's getting. With Jimmy Kimmel's show, the, the attention that we got globally, I really think that is going to be a good thing for the community. But maybe, uh, Maybe, you know, it's, uh, it's run its course now, you never know. Look, there's everything beside the name. When I get a, when I get calls, I've got calls from all over the world about the name of Dillo. And what I said to people, I said, you come to Dillo for the name, but after you get to Dillo, you'll find out how well steeped we are, are in heritage and culture, and then you'll forget about the name. Can you talk to me a bit about the origin of the name, like, where does it come from? Well, there's a few different interpretations about the origin of the name. When we were growing up, we were told that it was, it could have been a Spaniard sailed in here, and it could have been uh, probably a Spaniard captain's name or a ship's name. And then there was another young fellow only about, uh, almost about 10 years ago. He went to Spain, and he came across a sword. It's called a bilbo. Now, Knowing the way that Newfoundlanders change around the names, he, to make it easier, he probably said Dillo, so it could have come from there. The best one we found yet, I think, is, is French and English and everything all connected, and it's called Dual Do. It's uh, two islands to the entrance of this harbor here. So we figure that instead of people saying Dual Do, of course, it was a whole lot easier for people to say Dillo. We started economic development uh, cooperation after the codfish moratorium. I don't know if you know much about the codfish moratorium, but it was 
10 to 30 years ago now, and there was no bed and breakfasts here, there was no uh, hotels, but since then, all this stuff has sprouted up, and the boat tours and everything, and uh, it gradually started to pick up, but in the last year, especially since the brewery's been over there, I mean, people have been coming left and right, and I got to say, even this year, I think it's after picking up even more. We'll probably continue to do so. Well, the name Dildo has been controversial in the past, so controversial that two Toronto Maple Leafs fans were asked to leave an NHL game because their sign, which had the name Dildo written on it, was considered too vulgar. Here's Susan Pedler from 2001. On Trinity Bay, there's a community so beautiful, it was recently named one of the top 10 prettiest places in Canada. But sometimes it's this town's name that gets all the attention. Welcome to Dildo, population 500. And just about everyone here, at some point, has had to defend the town's name. Seems like it's Max Reed's turn. Reed was in Toronto last week to visit his terminally ill brother and take him to a Leafs game. Like other fans, Reed's brother waved a sign, hoping the camera would catch him. The sign that his daughter made for him was, uh, go Leafs go, uh, hello Dildo Newfoundland, which was a way he had to, to show people that he was out and about, I guess. Seems the Leafs organization wasn't too impressed. And the missus wanted us to roll up the sign and told us we were a disgrace and it was vulgar and what have, what have you. So we didn't, we didn't grasp that too well. Eventually, the brothers gave up the fight. They took down their sign and left the game. It's not the first time there's been a problem convincing people the town's name is for real. No one here even knows where the name came from. But most people consider it a blessing. Rowena Smith is curator of the local museum. She says tourism is booming, and it's all because of the name. New businesses have started up with regards to craft stores and things like that. And people love to buy t-shirts, and we have our own um, dildo dollars. Locals are pretty attached to the name they've had for hundreds of years, and there's no convincing them it should be changed. I have the name on the product changed before I change the name of the community. The Leafs, it seems, wouldn't agree. They stand by their decision to ask the Reeds to take down their sign. Max Reed says he'll start cheering for another team. But where would we put the Whitburn or Blaketown or New Harbour on the sign? We're not from there. We're from here, you know, and we're proud of it. Susan Pedler, CBC News, Dildo.
Ashley is standing by with a look at the weather forecast. So, uh, Ashley, there are so many rumors going around that Jimmy Kimmel may be coming to Dildo tomorrow. So if he does show up, <laughs> what will the weather be like for him? Yeah, it doesn't look too bad across the province. We're in kind of a little bit of a long st or longer stretch, I should say, of some nice weather. So we'll take a look at the forecast for tomorrow across the province. It does look like it should be nice for the most part. We could see some pop-up showers through the day. Temperatures sitting uh, around 18 degrees in St. John's, really anywhere along the Avalon, somewhere between 18 and 22. Uh, towards Clarenville, 21 degrees. And then as we head towards the West Coast, a little bit warmer. Humber Valley, 25 degrees. And Corner Brook should sit around 24 as your afternoon high now up through Labrador double digits along the west coast uh, along the rather the east coast uh, coastal Labrador it's 13 degrees for Cartwright 18 for Happy Valley Goose Bay again we could see that risk of a few thunderstorms there as well as the northern peninsula and then Lab City sitting at 17 degrees. Now looking ahead uh, through the day on Thursday into the overnight, you can see things will clear out once we get that potential for some showers through. Uh, and then for Friday, it actually looks like a lovely afternoon. Just some cloudy periods as of now. Uh, we could see some showers develop up through Labrador. Otherwise, uh, we're looking at a pretty nice day. Those showers will move in looks like later on in the afternoon, but overall temperatures pretty similar to what we're seeing or what we're going to see tomorrow climbing a little bit. We'll start to see that humidity make its way back across the province as well. 25 degrees for Grand Falls, Windsor, Cornerbrook 22 and then uh, up to the 23 degrees for Happy Valley Goose Bay Lab City sitting around 19. Now over the next five days temperatures will be a little bit below seasonal it looks like for eastern Newfoundland and St. John's uh, 18 degrees to get into Friday. Saturday looks like the chance of showers late day and then it'll continue through Saturday or Sunday at least the first half right now and then we should actually see some clearing those temperatures around 18 degrees. Monday is when that heat will return for you. Now for central Newfoundland a pretty similar for forecast but those temperatures will be a little bit warmer so in the mid to high 20s by the time Sunday rolls around with plenty of sunshine Monday that chance of showers and 27 degrees and then for Western Newfoundland uh, you're sitting around 24 25 degrees it looks like so not much movement as far as that temperature goes and uh, it does look like sunshine for the most part slight chance again of some pop-up showers tomorrow otherwise next shot of showers looks like it will be for Monday and then for eastern Labrador 18 degrees tomorrow and then we dump up into those 20 degree temperatures by Monday we're looking at sunshine and uh, a similar temperature and then for western Labrador 17 degrees tomorrow Friday looking at 19 and then 21 for Saturday with uh, plenty of sunshine there so uh, just before we go to break I want to share uh, this lovely weather photo with you uh, I want to know where this t uh, was taken it was sent to us uh, somewhere, I'll tell you, somewhere in the big land. You take a guess, and then I'll tell you after the break. Thanks, Ashley. Well, we're hearing new details about a recent family vacation that took a scary turn. An American couple and their two kids were camping in Banff, Banff, Alberta last week when a wolf apparently ripped into their tent and attacked the family. They're calling a Calgary man who ran to help them their guardian angel. Um, I just kind of kept my, mom my momentum going and I just uh, kicked it in the back half, just kind of like I was trying to kick it in the door. We've never really done before. But. Russ Fee had rushed over from a neighboring campsite when he heard the screams. He says he saw the massive wolf trying to drag a man away. His kick appeared to have startled the animal into letting go of its would-be prey. The family managed to get away and run to Fee's campsite and take shelter in his vehicle. Parks Canada tracked and killed the wolf believed to be responsible for the attack. A 16-year-old climate change activist who inspired student protests around the world has begun her zero-emission journey across the Atlantic Ocean. Instead of flying, Sweden's Greta Thunberg set sail today from England to the U.S. I'm not telling anyone what to do or what not to do. I'm just doing this because I want to do this myself. And uh, I am one of the very, very few people in the world who actually can do this. And then I think I should take that chance to do this. 
Thunberg is on her way to New York, where she's scheduled to speak at the United Nations Climate Action Summit next month. She's hitching a ride on a racing yacht powered by wind, sun and underwater electricity turbines. There is no toilet or shower on board and she'll be eating freeze dried food. But the teenager says she's looking forward to the adventure and that she hopes to raise awareness so that political leaders will do more to fight climate change. Thunberg has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Welcome back to Here and Now. And Ashley, uh, during your weather forecast, you showed us a gorgeous uh, photo. Normally, I uh, don't like to see clouds in the sky, but in this case, it's different. Uh, where was this photo taken? Oh, and we just lost Ashley, unfortunately. We, and that means I don't think we can show you the photo again. Oh, there we go. I had the power. <laughs> Yes, what a gorgeous shot uh, this is and uh, was taken in Whitman Lake and sent to us uh, by Jessica Marsh. So thank you so much for sending that in to us. If you have a photo you would like to share with us, please email us at nlphotos at cbc.ca. Well, that wraps up this edition of Here and Now. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens over the next couple of days, whether or not Jimmy Kimmel does actually show up to Dildo tomorrow. We'll be on the ground to find out. Good night.